Well, hey, welcome to Elements. Let's all stand together. We're gonna call on the name of Jesus tonight as we sing. So let's lift up our voices with joy, amen?
narrow road that leads to life, but I want to be on it. It's a narrow road, but the mercy's wide, because you're good on your promise. I'll take you at your word.
Oh, the perfect Son of God in all his innocence, here walking in the dirt with you and me. He knows what living is, he's acquainted with our grief. A man of sorrow, son of suffering. Oh, blood and seas, how can it be? There's a God who weeps, there's a God who bleeds, who will praise the one who would reach for me. Hallelujah to the sun. Distant and moved, but you chase the sound in merciful pursuit. To the sin you were graced, and the broken you embraced. And in the end, the proof is in your wounds. In the end, the proof is in. There's a God who weeps, there's a God who bleeds, who oh, prays the one who would reach for me. Your cross, my freedom, your stripes, my healing, all oh, praise, King Jesus, glory to God in heaven, your blood still speaking, your love is still reaching, all oh, praise, King Jesus, glory to God forever, your cross, my freedom, your stripes, my healing, all praise, King Jesus, glory to God in heaven, your blood still speaking, your love still reaching, all praise, King Jesus, glory to God forever.
forever. Amen. Hey, why don't you just stand for a little bit? Um, we're going to pray in a few minutes, but just want to say welcome to church. Are you glad you're here? Are you thankful for this worship team? You guys did awesome. Look at this. Wow. Oh, and Danny too. Wow. What happens if I press this? Okay, I'm just kidding. I'm having fun. He um, might be older than me, but he, he dressed like me tonight because he wants to be like me. <laughs> Kidding. Well, hey, welcome. If you're new or visiting, you're watching online, uh, we just want to say welcome. We're glad that you're with us. Uh, there's a bunch of different ways that you can connect with us as a church community. Uh, we have an app you can download, a connection card. You can text 520-340-6868. And if you just text the word hello, uh, we'd get in touch with you. And uh, each and every week for people who are new or visiting or just kind of checking out church, they're not sure where they stand, we have a 10-minute party in the back. It's always a vibe. Like I said last time, there's a lamp back there. It's a bit of a mood. We got some kettle corn. Uh, Jack likes to say it's the best on this side of the Grand Canyon. So I think that's a pretty good deal. Uh, what do you think? You with me? Yeah? Cool. Hey, um, if you call Element City Church home, I just want to say thank you so much for your faithful giving. You're what makes this place possible. You're what keeps the lights on and the gospel being preached and pastors on staff who care for you and love you. And so that's really awesome. And I just want to say thank you for that. Um, and now we're going to pray. So I just want to give a couple moments to share around some prayer requests and praise reports before we continue on with the service. Okay. Awesome. You're a little quiet. Were you touched by that song? Are we still like in a moment of worship? We're like, sing it again. No. Do another one. No, okay. We can have fun, right? Cool. Hey, we got some, some real needs in our community. Somebody um, reached out and they just said, you know, they're looking for um, some counseling. They're, they're starting to realize going through this discipleship program that they've They've got some hurt. They've got um, some things in the past that they're they're walking through, and so they're they're in search of some counseling and some healing from some situations. And how many people know that that's real? That stuff in your past is tough to process. It's tough to go through. We all carry stuff, and so let's lift up that person in prayer tonight. Let's lift up that person who's praying for healing. We have another person in our community who um, this is really sad, but unfortunately, they they tragically lost their son. And um, as, a, as a parent myself, I can't imagine any parents in this room, you, you can't even fathom the heartache and the hurt that they might be going through. So um, as a community, let's band together. Let's lift this person up for peace and for healing and that God would bring restoration through this tragedy. Um, God can do anything. And I want to encourage you, if you haven't put in prayer requests, if you haven't reached out, if you haven't, you know, told anybody what you're going through, lean on each other. We're the church. Share that prayer request. Share that need that you have because God can do anything. But even in the middle of the waiting for that, we can carry each other's burdens, right? We can rejoice with those who are rejoicing and we can grieve with those who are grieving and we can be the body of Christ for one another. So I want to encourage you, if you have need in your life, put it through. Let's pray for it. A few weeks ago, I actually shared that we weren't sleeping very much, that we have a one-year-old who wasn't sleeping. And this awesome lady in our church came running up to me right after church and she prayed for us and prayed for our daughter. 
And um, she's still waking up a little bit, but it's like once a night. How many know, like when you go from like five to like once a night, that's amazing. That's a miracle for us. It's huge for us. And even more than that, it was so touching that somebody cared, that somebody wanted to pray. And I just want you to know if you feel alone, if you feel like you don't have anybody to carry your burdens with you, you're not alone. And the body of Christ wants to carry those burdens with you. And Jesus wants to be with you in the midst of those situations. Amen? Cool. All right. And lastly, we want to pray for Rincon Valley Cowboy Church. They're the church of the week this week. What an awesome church name. Rincon Valley Cowboy Church. Their pastor, Ray McCaw. They're a cowboy church. They do like gospel cowboy music on Sundays. Pretty cool. Um, and so we want to lift them up. They, they're really passionate about the word of God and, and spreading the gospel. And so we want to lift them up and, and stand with them as a church. And so let's pray for these people who are hurting in our community. Let's pray for this church. And then Jack's going to come. Pastor Jack's going to come and preach the word. Amen. All right, let's pray. Well, Father, we still our hearts before you. We thank you, God, that we can come to you with all of our need, with all of our grief, with all of our hurt. And also with all of our joy and our celebration and our rejoicing, that we can bring everything to you, God. We thank you for that, that you're not closed off, that you're not distant, that you're not hidden, but that you're before us and that you care for us, that your heart is open to us. So I lift up this person, God, who's dealing with hurt from the past. We pray, God, that you would bring in a flood of healing and peace like never before. God, would you put... Um, peace into their hearts and their minds. Give them a still, a stillness in this season that they're facing, God. For this person, God, who lost their son, we just lift them up to you, God. We don't even have words for some of the things that happen in this life. But you're good and you're faithful and you never abandon or forsake us. And God, even in the worst of tragedies, we can call on you and find help in our time of need. And so as a body, we just call on you for this person right now. We pray, God, that you would bring peace that surpasses all understanding, that you would be their strength and comfort as they walk this journey. God, we lift up Ray McCaw and Rincon Valley Cowboy Church. We thank you for him, God. We thank you for them and their 10-gallon hats, their cowboy gospel music. Pray that you bless them as they preach the gospel, as they, as they teach the word, um, that you would continue to use them as a community here in Tucson. And lastly, we just pray for Pastor Jack as he comes to share around your word, God. Would you speak through him? Would you use him? And would you open up our hearts to receive the word tonight? In the name of Jesus, amen. You can grab a seat. <clears throat> Thanks for being a church that worships together, prays for one another, helps one another. Uh, I'm waving and uh, intentionally waving. So Alita, I see you from home. One of our oldest members, one of our newest, Ignatius, right here, three weeks, three weeks, two weeks old, two weeks old, um, and everybody in between. We, we fit all in between, the rest of us, uh, and so it is a, a joy to be back with you. Um, uh, I, Amy and I got to do a little staycation this year, next year, is traveling some, and, and so we got to go to a, an awesome little church in Ahwatukee, um, Phoenix area last week, but friends, there's nothing like being with family. And so it's, it's a joy uh, to be home and, and to be back with you. If we haven't met, I'm Jack, uh, one of the pastors here. And, and um, I just wanted to take a moment and, and thank, uh, to thank Lyle, to thank our team. Uh, we have an amazing team here. Um, and as one who has been here for 10 years and one who's walked through the journeys of our journey, 10 years old, um, I, I just... I can't tell you how awesome it is to be able to go away and have a vacation and know that it's better than when I'm there, maybe. And, like, it's just, that is a real treat 
uh, and an honor, and I'm grateful for the culture that you all contribute to, and I'm grateful for the culture we get to build and the vision we get to pursue, and so I'm grateful for Lyle and for Micah and Matt and Jen and a host of other people. You know who you are, our small group leaders, and I just, as, as the pastor and leader here, I'm just delighted, uh, truly am. Uh, humbled and delighted uh, to see what God's building here. Uh, Also, it's a treasure and a gift. And speaking of that, uh, I also want to give honor to God for doing something that this life of the church has never experienced before this last year. Uh, This last year, we just finished our fiscal year. So July 1 through June 30 is our fiscal year. And we just finished over the 300,000 mark for the first time in the history of this church. And so <clears throat> I, <clears throat> I, give, I give God all credit for that. Uh, he's the one that's building something here. I take that as a leader, uh, as a sign of the best is yet to come. Uh, most small to mid-sized churches do not ever cross that threshold. And so the fact that God's enabled us through your generosity and our partnership together uh, to do something that enables us to give, uh, we're blessed to be a blessing. And so that, that positions us to, to do way more than just keep the lights on. Uh, that positions us in a way to have ministry and to have an impact, to see our family ministry having tripled over the last two years, uh, to see the opportunities that we have to bless nonprofits and to partner with other agencies around town uh, through your giving here. And so for those of you who give and have partnered with us, I'm grateful for that. Uh, we don't take that lightly and we try to steward it wisely uh, and well. And if, if that's something that you've never even crossed your mind, uh, then friend, I'm just going to invite you to buckle up and jump in, and uh, we're going to see where God takes this, and I'm excited for the journey uh, that lies ahead of us. So with that, uh, we'll dive into sermon mode now. So again, grateful to be back with you. So if you have your Bibles, you can open them, um, and we're going to be in a place where um, I'm going to set this up a little bit. We're talking about confession. So Psalm 32 is where we're eventually going to get to, because we've been looking at practices of, of the life of Jesus. And, and Lyle did an amazing job looking at hospitality and looking at a last couple of things. And again, if you have not, if you've missed one or two over the last, uh, six, I think we're week six or seven into this, I just invite you to go back on the app and, and catch up with us. And the greatest takeaway again is, listen, we're invited as followers of Jesus to do all of these. But our goal, I'm going to state it real clearly again so you hear it. Our goal is that maybe the Holy Spirit would whisper to you one or two of these practices and rhythms that he would like to go a little bit deeper with you on over the next six months to a year. That's the goal. So as we go through this week in and week out and doing different practices and what we see in the, from the New Testament writers and scripture, what we see uh, what we, in the life of Jesus and what he lived out, that's the invitation is to find that. And tonight this practice of confession is something that we might struggle with um, because I, I think that's a difficult challenge in our culture because uh, we tend, uh, if you're like me, we tend to want to blame other people for things. We tend to not want to necessarily own our stuff, our, our issues, okay? Um, we tend to deflect in a lot of ways. Um, but this idea of growing as a disciple of Jesus is, hey, that I would, I would be more like him in my shoes. And I would be on this journey to live out this kind of life. And tonight I want to look at this practice of confession in two sides of one coin. Okay, confession as cleansing and confession as anchoring. And I want us to experience this tonight. So when you came in, you were invited to take one of just an index card. Maybe you got a blue one, a yellow one, a white one, whatever. If you're watching from home, it just invites you to get a scrap piece of paper, okay? Because we're going to do something with this as a part of the practice of uh, confession as cleansing. I want to walk us through that. We're going to take communion tonight. So if you're watching from home, you can get some elements there that you can take. I've done it with Dr. Pepper and fishy crackers. So whatever. Um, Like find something at home. If you're here, we're going to take communion together. You'll notice that it's down front and that's on purpose. You didn't get it when you walked in. That's on purpose. I'm going to walk you through this, okay? Hang with me. You're fine. Um, And then the kind of confession is anchoring I want to end with tonight as we kind of do a little bit of responsive reading. So for all the introverts in the room, yes, we're going to talk out loud. 
what? Yeah, I'm going to help you with it. You've got 35 minutes to prepare for it. Like, I, I, you're, you're good. You're solid, okay? So, uh, maybe 40. No, I, we'll get there. Okay, so confession is this idea of trying to remain relationally right. How many of you are married? How many of you have significant friends in your life that you have a relationship with? That should be everybody else, okay? So like one of the categories, here's the reality of what you know about healthy relationships. You mess up, right? You blow it. And what do you do to help keep things relationally right? You fess up, right? See, when we mess up, we fess up. That, that's the rhythm of healthy relationships. Unhealthy relationships mess up and then ignore or run or never acknowledge or, or they keep one-upping the mess-ups and so it, it never becomes back to a place where reconciliation or restoration can happen. And so the reality of the practice of confession, in, in essence, if you remember nothing else tonight, here's the challenge. Keep short accounts with God and others. Just learn to keep short accounts with God and others. You will have a blessed life if you choose to walk in this way and to walk in this practice. In a lot of ways, it's this confession is keeping short accounts with God. It's, it's letting the Spirit of God search our hearts. It's what I would call the holy spotlight moment. It's the moment where the Holy Spotlight of the Holy Spirit of God in kind of in reality brings honesty into our life. So I'll fess up. I called our water company this week. I was upset with our water company. The poor lady on the other end of the line. I was started off great. And then there was an exchange of things. And I didn't feel very respected. And I didn't yell, but I hung up on her. And I put the phone down, and I walked away, and I justified. See, I wasn't rude. I didn't yell. I just hung up. I, I was done with the conversation, and I didn't want the mom moment where she was trying to mom me of things. And I was just like, done. So I hung up and walked away. She would not know who I was. Well, she does my name. And, and then in that reality, it was the spirit of God going, uh, pff, immature much? <sighs> You're right. Um, that was an immature move. Um, and, and so it's this holy spotlight moment. That's one of many this week. Um, because I don't think I'm abnormal. I think I'm normal. And by normal, I mean broken. And my hunch is you are too. And there's probably moments where you wish in the moment you would recognize it and go, oh, I need to, I need to fess up. Because that's part of, of getting relationally right is to own to own up and to fess up, to learn to keep short accounts. And maybe we've looked at these couple verses before, so I just want to highlight them real quick. This is a great practice, a great couple verses for this practice of confession, for you to make a part of a repertoire of your life if you're going to live out this rhythm. The first one is this, Psalm 139. It's a real simple prayer. It's a beautiful psalm uh, of David writing, hey, God knows everything about you. And at the very end, he closes it with this holy spotlight moment. Let the holy spotlight come on your life so that you learn to keep short accounts with God. Search me, God. Know my heart. Test me and know my concerns. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. Like, search my heart. Turn on the spotlight and, and let's go to town and let's, I, I can't, I can't, work on relationships with others or my relationship with God if I don't own it and fess up. 1 John 1, 8 and 9 says this, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Hello. If you claim to be without sin, then, well, there's an issue here, the scripture's saying. But if you confess our sin, he, God, is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Confession is actually really good for the soul. 
fact, study after study shows this to be reality. It's why you see, why you and I see, uh, even digital confessions. People which started with the internet of people who were able to call up a line and just leave an anonymous confession to things. Uh, like, you'll see this in different, every different expression. It is, it is hard to own things because we don't like what we see in ourselves at times. One scholar said the greatest sin is maybe to lose the sense of sin. If sin is just an aberration caused by oppressive social structures or environments or temperamental tyrants or cultural influences or your upbringing, then we might admit to generic humanity sin, but we might deny what we ourselves specifically are sinners. We see ourselves really basically as nice, benevolent people with minor hang-ups and neuroses with the common lot of all humanity, yet we can each rationalize terrifyingly our ability to make peace with evil and thereby reject all the things that are not nice about how our conduct is, how our thought life is, how we react in moments or act in moments. See, the essence of sin really lies at the enormity of our own self-centeredness. Here's what I know about you, because it's true about me. I'm the most self-centered person in my universe. And you are too. And so the challenge here, the invitation we'll get there, is that confession's actually, actually a blessing. And you can either choose concealment or you can choose confession. But the choice is yours. And they will lead down a different path. Sometimes we can gloss over our own selfishness or rationalize evil or our brokenness. We can even fall into the fantasy of pretend or comparison. Like, oh, I'm way better than so-and-so over there. I'm way better than them. We can give them the name them. Mentally, it keeps us from actually making sin personal. My own personal violation and rebellion against God, his principles, his standard, and his best for me. I can make it someone else's issue. I can point out all the other issues of someone else and say, well, I'm not that bad. I'm not there. Like many scholars before me and throughout history, they've noted that the bomb that went off when sin entered the picture, creation, beautiful, God created, and announced this is good. And then the fall happens. Sin enters the picture. Total depravity becomes reality. And though we were made and are made in the image of God, we are marred by sin. And that forces us to be separated from a perfect and holy God. Someone had to figure out a way to bridge the gap. And thank goodness, God did. And he sent Jesus to bridge that gap. He didn't leave it up to you to figure it out. Didn't leave it up to me to figure it out. Why? We don't have, that's above our pay grade. We wouldn't have figured it out. But he made a way. Perhaps it takes humility for us to understand our own sinfulness. And I know talking about sin is not an easy thing. In fact, a lot of people don't want to admit and own their own sin. They'll say, I'm a part of brokenness of humanity, of culture around me. Uh, I, yes, I'm, I'm off kilter a little bit in that, but I don't. But here's what I would say to you. If you're in any kind of healthy relationship, you know when you blow it. And you know the only way to restore that relationship is to fess up and to own up to what you did. And the invitation before us is to make confession a practice. And not only will it bless your relationships one to another, but it will actually bless your relationship with God. See, you cannot receive what the crucified rabbi wants to give unless we admit our plight and stretch out our heart and pure honesty to receive what we need and what we could not provide for ourselves, forgiveness from our sins. Perhaps one of the clearest marks of humility is stark, raving honesty. And maybe that's the invitation of confession, is to be stark, raving in your honesty about yourself. And that's hard, friends. It's so much easier to, to make a veneer. It's so much easier to try to pretend. It's so much easier to deflect. 
But the hard work of humility is to be honest. Here's me. Here's my stuff. God, that is so off from what you desire and what you dream and what you have for me. And forgive me for going there again. Forgive me for for buying the lie and taking the detour. Forgive me for for not putting other people first, for putting myself first. See, in a dog-eat-dog world, it it becomes almost rationalizing to say, well, just look out for yourself. But Jesus models something very, very different. And so the challenge of confession is an honest struggle. He does something for us that we cannot do for ourselves. The bleeding, crucified Christ we see in Jesus settling the debt that we could not pay. And lifted up on our behalf, those who look to him find freedom. They find freedom that they need, mercy they don't deserve, and healing that they crave, and a hope that they cannot manufacture on their own. It's why John writes in John 3, 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life has the forgiveness of sins, has the hope of the world within them. It's through his passion and death that Jesus carried away the essential sickness of the human heart and broke forever the hypocrisy of every single soul. Yours, and listen here, mine too. Mine too. I needed Jesus, and you need him. Whether you recognize that yet right now in this moment or not, you needed him. And you need him. He has made his pierced heart a safe place for every defeated cynic and every hopeless sinner across the end of all time. This is what Colossians writes, the Apostle Paul. For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in Christ and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth, things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Colossians 1, 19 through 20. Brendan Manning uh, wrote a book called Abba's Child, recommended it, a great book. He says this, the crucified says, confess your sins that I might reveal myself to you as lover, teacher, and friend. That fear may depart and your heart may stir again in passion. Perfect love drives out what? Fear. That's what the scripture says. Most of the time when we don't want to confess, we're afraid. We're fearful of the outcome. We're fearful of owning that. We're fearful of what might transpire and the ripple effect that this may cause. But if perfect love drives out fear, then the invitation of confession is to, is to confess and to come before our loving Savior, the one who made a way. See, the beauty is we don't have to deal with our sin. We just have to own up to it. Someone else took care of it for us. Whew. I just have to own it if I want to have a relationship that's healthy and whole. And i got to own that with God, and i got to own that with others. And so confession needs to be this practice that we have. We tend to overestimate the cost of confession and underestimate the cost of concealment. Confession is about living an unhidden, authentic life in a relationship with God and others. Concealment is about the habit of the cover-up kind of life. Confession leads to forgiveness and freedom. Concealment leads us into deeper bitterness and bondage. And David writes about this. In fact, he writes Psalm 51 about one of his darkest moments in life, one of his greatest failures. Like, he was a complete jerk. Blew it. The man after God's own heart blew it and owned it. Fessed up to it. Psalm 32 is another journal entry. The Psalms are really kind of journal entries. They're songs and and they're entries into here's what it means to live life, an authentic life with all the emotions before God. That's why I love the Psalms. Psalm 32, here's how he talks about concealment and confession. He says, oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty before God. When I refused to confess my sin, I'm living in concealment 
he's talking about. My body wasted away. I groaned all day. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Can you all relate? No amen, sir? Okay. Finally, he says, I confessed all my sin to you. I stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you, what, forgave me. All my guilt is gone. David begins by saying, confession is for your sake. It's for your good. Confession is a blessing. It brings a blessing. Learn to keep short accounts with God and others. That you might live a a confessing type of life that says, I'm not trying to hide. I'm not trying to conceal. When I mess up, I fess up. I want to keep short accounts. When we choose the path of confession, we live an unhidden, more authentic life. And isn't that what you want deep down? Isn't that what you want from others? To have an authentic life in an AI-generated world? Like, that's what we want. Authenticity is a valuable commodity in the spiritual life and in the real life, one to another. It's why probably some of your deepest relationships and friendships are with people that you would say they're real. Like, they get it. They're not one thing this way and a different thing another day. Like, and when they, when they mess up, they fess up. Like, confession's a part of their life. See, confession is, isn't doing something about our sin. Rather, it's admitting that we can't do anything about our sin and our brokenness and trusting that God did the something we couldn't do in Jesus and in his life and in his death and in his resurrection. David says, when I refuse to confess, my body wasted away. See, confession is so much greater than the path of concealment. The practice of concealment just allows your past to keep invading your present and train wreck you. But confession, confession brings things into the open. Confession says, okay, God, I need work, and I need you to go to work in me. The biblical truth is this. What we try to cover up, God will uncover. What you uncover, God will cover over with his grace. See, when you practice the practice of confession, then the cover over of God's grace can happen. See, you can try to live the concealment way and and cover it up, but the reality is, the scriptures say, God will reveal it someday. He will uncover it. And it will come out. And it will be there. One of the most important verses, if I confess my sin, you are faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse. That's what God So the prayer of confession is just agreeing with what David said. God, here's the truth about me. I'm a sinner. I screwed up. That isn't something I hide from. It's not something I blame others for. I rebelled against you. I lusted. I lied. I cheated. I stole. I gave in to pride. I slandered. I gossiped. I hated. I would fill in the blank because you got yours and I got mine. Fill it in. God, I did that. I want to own that. I want to confess my sin to you so that my prayers don't go unhindered. Isaiah 59 talks about that, that if you live with sin long enough and don't confess it, your prayers go unanswered. God says, when you confess up, then then we'll start talking again. But why? The relationship gets challenged. You've seen that happen in your own relationships, haven't you? When you don't understand that you have to own up to the mess up and then fess up, the relationship goes sideways, doesn't it? there's a rift that happens. That's reality. That's what David is writing about. And so he says, listen, you want to be the person who chooses the path of confession, not the path of concealment. In fact, he goes on in verse 7. He ends kind of in the middle of this psalm with a whole shout to joy and victory of confession. For you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with songs of victory. Songs of victory through confession? Yep. Why? Because you didn't conceal it anymore. Now you get to live in the victory of that. Why? Victory because your lying schemes were forgiven. Your lustful thoughts forgiven. Your manipulation forgiven. Your religious hypocrisy forgiven. Your self-centeredness forgiven. Your anger and bitterness forgiven. Your pride, your guilt, your shame, your stuff forgiven. Why? 
Because if I confess my sins, he is faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse. That's the practice of confession from a sense of cleansing and seeking that. See, that brings us to the beauty of the cross, of the table. And so in a moment, here's what I'm going to invite you to do. Uh, There are some pens in front of you in the chairs. I'm going to invite us to actually take a moment to seal this reality and to practice the practice of confession. And here's what that looks like. I do this from time to time. Really, it's taking Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. So I'm going to ask Ivy to put that up. It's just making this a prayer. God, search my heart. Put the holy spotlight on me, on my soul, on me, not humanity. And there's a lot of brokenness in humanity. We can all admit to that. We see it. No, no, but this is about you. This is about me. This is about God searching your heart, searching your life. And this isn't about guilt or shame. That's the enemy's voice. Why? Because guilt and shame take you to isolation. And that's where the enemy wants to take you. Where does confession take you? Right into the heart of God who can look at you in the eyes and say, I forgive you, I love you, I have better for you. And so let's work toward that. But I forgive you. See, godly sorrow is what the Apostle Paul writes about. That confession is about godly sorrow. It's about agreeing with God. What I chose to do there, what I chose to think about, how I chose to react there, that wasn't the best. That wasn't your best. That wasn't my best moment. And I want to confess that. I don't want there to be a rift in our relationship. And when you practice this and get better at this with God, listen, it will impact every other relationship you have. When this becomes a practice and a rhythm of you and God, it's amazing how the Holy Spirit says, okay, now you and I are good. Now let's go work on so-and-so. Because what you did there last week, yeah, that wasn't your best. And so let's work on that. And so here's the invitation for the next two minutes. I'm just going to invite you to actually pray this prayer, to let God's holy spotlight be on you in a a loving and tender way. This isn't about shame. This isn't about isolation. This is about an invitation. And maybe just ask God to show you, hey, in the last week or the last month, however what, not a year, that's too long, but like the last week, the last month, there's there's some stuff We all got stuff. Is there some stuff that you're like, "Ah, yeah, that wasn't God's best for me. I need to own that. And so jot it down. Write it down. See, when you mess up, you got to fess up. You got to own that. And so the invitation simply is to write that out. No one's going to see it. Like this isn't like high school math where you're trying to cheat on someone else. Listen, this is not high school math. This is just you and God having a moment. And then in two minutes, I'm gonna lead us in a prayer. I'm gonna invite you to come up. There's trash cans right here. You're gonna take that paper and you're gonna rip the shreds out of it. And you're gonna throw it in the trash. Why? Because you're forgiven as a follower of Jesus. And then you're gonna take communion and you can either take it up here, you can take it back to your seat. We're gonna lean into the truth of what Jesus did, his life, his death, his resurrection, that in that upper room, he said to his followers, do this in remembrance of me that this is my blood shed for you, for the forgiveness of what? Your sins. Not your neighbors, not the world. Yes, the world and the neighbors too, but yours. So take two minutes. You're gonna own it. Write it down. And then you're gonna come forward. You're gonna rip it up. You're gonna throw it away. And then you're gonna take the hope that's given to us. See, dealing with sin is not your problem to deal with. Jesus took care of that for you. We just need to believe it be enraptured by that. And then we're going to do a second part of the sermon. And I'll come back for that. So you got a minute and a half. Own it.
Father, we thank you for the practice of confession, the invitation to make this a rhythm of our life, not that we beat ourselves up, but that we're able to have our sin, our guilt, our shame beat up by your grace. Uh, That we're able to be people who, when we mess up, confess up. We can own it, not try to deflect it, not try to aim it somewhere else or blame someone else so that we can have a right relationship with you. And, And as we model that, then that would begin to spill over that we might have right relationships with those around us. So God, I I pray in short, would you help us to keep short accounts with you, with others? That confession would actually lead to the cleansing that you promise. If we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we take you at your word, a song we sang earlier, that you will do what you can do and what only you can do when we walk in this process. I pray for my friends that you'd help us each to make this a rhythm of our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Confession as as cleansing is important. Confession as anchoring for your soul is also, I think, equally important. And so I want to end with this part, and then we're going to sing a worship song together. But confession as anchoring for our soul is it's claiming and, and laying claim to what Jesus says about you, what Jesus says over you, what the scriptures declare about you and for you, more than what your world wants to whisper about you, more than what your soul will whisper to you at times, more than what the enemy will whisper in your direction at times. Throughout history, the church, the gathering of people who have oriented their life around Jesus to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus, not just a fan of Jesus, yay Jesus, no, a follower, one who actually walks this stuff out, trying to become more and more like him if he were walking around in your shoes. That that kind of person, that church, would be a people that would confess and hold to things. When the world was maybe squirreling stuff around them, they would say, no, we're going to hold to the truth. And so the Apostles' Creed is one of those things. I don't have time to go through it. I put it in your sermon notes. If you want to go to the app and go to sermon notes, you can find all this stuff. A lot of the stuff I already cut. I don't have time. Um, but you can find it in the Apostles' Creed. You can read about it. Maybe once a week. It's just reading that out again. This is what I'm clinging my life to. This is the foundation of my faith. It's what I'm holding to. But see, we did a series just a few weeks back, all through Romans chapter 8, didn't we? Romans chapter 8 is one of the beautiful passages of Scripture that speaks about your identity. It speaks God's truth over you and for you, how he relationally wants to be with you. And so I want to invite us to just confess by anchoring our soul to the truth of what God says for you. And so I'm going to read a portion of this and then, remember introverts, this is the moment. Um, We are all going to do a responsive reading. We hardly ever do that here. But we're going to do it. Okay, so when we get to the end, verses 37 through 39, we're going to read it out loud together. Just follow me, okay? And then we're going to sit with it for 30 seconds. I just want you to sit with what you just said over yourself. And then I'm going to read it over us again, and I'm going to walk off the stage. And we're going to lean into this last worship song, and we're going to have a moment with God. Okay? So that's where we're going. You ready? Romans chapter 8. I'll read this first part, starting in verse 31 through 35. Here's what it says. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. 
Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died. More than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is interceding for us. Do you want to know what Jesus is doing right now? Interceding for you to the Father. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword? No, we are more than conquerors. Here's what it says. Read it with me. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angel nor demon, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Sit with that. Just 30 seconds. Read back through it if you need to. What's the one word, the one phrase that God's jumping out to you right now? He's saying, this is for you. You confessed it to anchor your soul to this truth. What is it? Shall anything separate me from the love of Christ? Nope. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angel nor demon, nor present nor future, nor any power, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, my Lord. I'm not here for bliss. 
Father, we thank you that we can come before you, that we can bring everything um, to the foot of your cross. And so we just thank you for that opportunity to live freely before you, God. It's such a blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Are you glad you came to church tonight? Do you feel lighter? It's kind of one of those nights where you just kind of go, <sighs> right? Hey, um, can we thank Pastor Jack for that message? I think it was really important that we heard that. He's already back at the 10-minute party, but uh, Pastor Jack, I just want to say thank you for creating space for us as a church to do that. I think it was really significant for me, but I, I get the sense that it was significant for a lot of us, so thank you. I just accidentally touched the bottom of the mic and Micah's back there like, don't do that. And I'm going to hold it like this now. Anyway, good transition. Smooth, right? I'm a pro. What do you guys do with me every week? Like, you're like, when are you just going to be normal, dude? Anyway, at least laugh at me. Come on, laugh. Pit pity me. Laugh at me. All right. There's a crew going to dinner at Portil Portillo's at El Con, just a little ways down the road, right? Lyle's gone. I was looking for affirmation. He's just not there anymore. <sighs> just, you know, leaving us on a high note tonight. All right, uh, just uh, want to say 10-minute party in the back for anybody who's new or visiting. Go back there. I'll be back there. Jack's back there. We want to meet you. And uh, thanks for being in church. We'll see you next week. Be blessed. <laughs>